kids stay in there or are they going to leave after? Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends in Christ, for five weeks of Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. Today we come together to begin the solemn celebration of Holy Week. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us remember with devotion his entry that culminated at the empty tomb and follow him with a lively faith, united with him by baptism, we share in his resurrection and new life. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let us pray. God, our Father, we remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem and was welcomed as a king by those who shouted Hosanna and spread their clothing and palm branches in his path. Accept our praise and listen to our prayers as we rejoice in our triumphant king, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Please be seated.
We pray. <clears throat> we praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path. So may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the Old Testament, comes from Jack- Zechariah chapter 9. In Zechariah, we have here a prophecy of something that was going to happen many years later of our, our Savior riding into Jerusalem, a very unique king who does not look like a king in this world, but who is exactly the type of king that we needed. Zechariah chapter 9. Greatly, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson comes from Philippians chapter 2. And in this lesson, again, we see a very unique Messiah that the people were looking forward to, a a Messiah, a Savior, who would humble himself to the point of being our servant, serving us so that he could be, so that we could have exactly what we needed in our Savior. Philippians chapter 2, it reads, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our Lord. Now invite all the children to come forward for the children's message. Morning, everybody. Thanks for singing today. For those of you who sing, that was great. I'm going to show you a f- uh, something here, a few things. Um, you guys know what that is? Can you see that? It's not very big. Here's another one here. Can you see it? Maybe it's a little better. You can see it like that. See that? Yeah, they're little tiny seeds. Yeah, there's another one. Yep, there's a seed. So this is a seed for zucchini plant, all right, zucchini. This is a seed for squash, and this is a seed for a cucumber, this little tiny one here. And what happens is if you plant these, probably not today, but when the snow goes away, when you plant these, by the end of the summer, this little thing that doesn't look like all that much right now turns into something big and huge. And by the end of the summer, we usually have zucchini coming out of our ears in my household. We have lots of zucchini. My wife tries to throw it in everything that we eat. And then this cucumber too, we have tons of, this little thing is going to produce a whole lot of cucumbers for us. So you can have pickles or put them in your salads or whatever you want to do. You can do that with this little tiny seed. Isn't that amazing? That's really what, ha- what we're talking about today with Palm Sunday. See, on Palm Sunday, we see something that We see someone who doesn't really look like much. He doesn't look like much of a king. He rides in on a donkey. And then later on this week, on Friday, you know what happens to Jesus on Friday of this week? Anybody know? What? He goes on the cross, exactly. Yeah, he goes on the cross and he dies. Does that look like something that a king would do? Hang on a cross for us? No, but he 
He doesn't look like much, but in a few days later, on Easter Sunday, something incredible happens where we get to see just how incredible Jesus is. What happens on Sunday of this week? Does anybody know? What do you think happens? He rises from the dead on Easter, exactly. That's what happens to Jesus. And then we get to see just how great he really is. So someone who today doesn't seem like all that much, later on turns into something amazing for us. Should we pray to Jesus and thank him for being so much for us, despite what we see with our eyes? Dear Jesus, we thank you for coming in this world, sacrificing your life for, for us, and being everything that we needed in a Savior. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats now. Thanks. We'll continue with the singing of the next hymn. For our sermon today, we're going to be focusing on the gospel lesson that I read as we began the service this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, I'm just going to read the last few verses that are found there, starting in verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of our Lord. When was the last time you had one of those days where you get home for a long day of work, you sit down on the couch and you say, Lord, take me now. <laughs> Save me from this world of, of problems, of frustrations, of, of difficulty. You know, we've gotten... We've gotten used to the fact that there's always some problem going on in our life, some frustration that we have to deal with, something new that we have to go through. 
um, a new cross that we have to bear. Every once in a while, the Lord will take some cross out of our life that we don't have to deal with anymore. But more often than not, it seems that more are, are added to our plate, more difficulties, more problems. And some of you know what it's like for your prayers to change, where at first you pray that whatever that problem is just goes away. But later on, it, your prayers change so that you're simply asking the Lord to give you strength to deal with that problem. And there's those days you, you go home and, and the best you can muster in your prayers is, Lord, I'm tired. Save me now. Save me now. Today on Palm Sunday and throughout this week, really hitting the, the climax of it on Easter Sunday, is we get to consider the greatest rescue effort this world has ever seen. And today on Palm Sunday, we get to think about just how thoroughly your God saves you. How all-encompassing his salvation is. Our English language doesn't quite catch it. When it comes to the, the word Jesus and the word that you've said already today a couple of times, Hosanna. They're actually related, even though they don't sound like that in English. You remember when Mary came to I'm sorry, when Gabriel came to Mary when she was pregnant, she said, you're going to be the mother of the Son of God. And she gave her one command. She said, you are going to give him, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus or Yeshua or Joshua means the Lord saves. Now fast forward 33 years after that, when Jesus was born. 33 years later, we have him here on Palm Sunday. And this Jesus who rides into Jerusalem, the people there, the one whose name means the Lord saves, the people there are shouting at him, Hosanna, which is a form of the verb, form of the word that comes from Jesus, meaning save us now. So how fitting when this person that the Lord had sent, whose name means the Lord saves, the people see him, when they see him face to face, they say, save us now, Lord. We can almost pinpoint the exact day. It was a Sunday before Passover. The, the disciples and Jesus, they were a few miles away from Jerusalem, leaving from Bethany. And as they headed into Bethany, or they, as they headed into Jerusalem, the people greeted them there with some shouts of praises and joy. Going into Jerusalem, a place that means house of peace, and yet within a week, that would be anything but a house of peace. The people's shouts of Hosanna would, would instantly change to crucify him. It was nearly to the point of a riot where the people demanded that this man, Jesus, be tortured and crucified. The start of that journey was very different than the end of the journey. The start that we see on Palm Sunday is very different than the end. Now, Jesus knew that. But the disciples... They didn't. And the people who were there on this Palm Sunday, they didn't understand it either. But it seems as if what they were shouting out, what they were saying, it, it shows that they believed that Jesus actually was the Messiah, the one that they were waiting for. Think about what they had done and what they were saying. They used palm branches, which is always a sign, an ancient sign of victory. And they put their, their cloaks on the ground so that when Jesus was on this donkey riding, they treated him like a king. That's the way that you would treat a king after a victory coming back into his hometown. That's how they were treating Jesus. And they shout out, Hosanna, save us now. Hosanna to the son of David. That's what they said. The son of David has always been a reference to the Messiah who was going to come into the world. The Messiah that they had been waiting for for thousands of years. And right after that, they have another phrase they use. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is a direct reference from Psalm 118, which is the hymn that they, the Jewish people would always sing around the time of Passover as they remembered that first deliverance 1,500 years earlier through Moses when God sent the 10 plagues and brought them out of slavery. Do you remember what happened? God's people were enslaved in Egypt and the Lord finally said, that's enough of this. So he decided he was going to bring them out of Egypt and he was going to use 10 different plagues to do it. But it was the last plague that finally did it. Where the Lord said that every firstborn, 
adult and child and even animal was going to die among the Egyptian households and even the Israelite household unless you take a lamb, an innocent lamb and an unblemished lamb and you kill it, and you take the blood from it and you put it over the doorposts of the home. And that night the angel would come and he would literally pass over that home sparing all the people who were inside all because of the blood of the lamb. Now you can imagine what happened when the Egyptians woke up. And there was death everywhere, crying and mourning everywhere. But for the Israelites, it was different. They recognized that because of the blood of the Lamb, they were spared. And not only that, but they were freed from slavery and they left Egypt that day. All because of the blood of the Lamb. That's what the people sang. As, as the people remembered the past and the deliverance that happened through Moses, they also thought about this other Messiah, the Savior who would come to deliver them from a greater type of slavery. But the question is, what type of salvation did they think that the Messiah would actually give them? What did they think the Messiah was going to save them from? From Roman rule? Just as he brought, the, brought them out from underneath the Egyptians, was he going to bring them out from underneath the Romans? Is that what the people in Jesus' day thought as they were shouting out, looking at Jesus and declaring that he is a Messiah? Is that what they thought? What did they want in a Messiah? Did they want someone who could continue to give them as much bread and fish as they wanted through his miracles? Did they want someone who could stick around and heal all their sick? Did he want someone who could rule as their king and who could give them ultimate peace, where they would no longer have any frustrations or problems that this world continued to give them. Is that what they wanted in Messiah? What do you want in a Messiah? People can say, and we do, say, you know what, I, I already know that Jesus died for my sins. I'm going to be in heaven someday. That's great, but... What I really need in my Messiah is what I really need is help with my marriage. What I really need is help with my kids. What I really need is help with what's going on at work. What I, what I really need is help with my issues. That's what I really need. And it's almost like we are disappointed with who our Messiah is, that if we could design exactly who our Savior is and have him do exactly what we want him to do, it would be different than who our Messiah actually was. And we're left disappointed. In our world, being saved seems to be a very clear-cut thing, right? If a person is drowning out in the ocean, they need to be saved. And a lifeguard goes out, he grabs them, pulls them back on shore, puts them on shore, now they are saved, right? Drowning in the ocean needs to be saved. On shore, saved. Pretty simple, right? But have you ever heard of something called dry drowning? Dry drowning. Where a person can inhale water, have it go in their lungs, and, and they can actually die from that. So a couple years ago, there's a sad story of a child, a four-year-old child in Texas, who was on the beach all day long, and a, a wave hit him, knocked him over. He got back up again. He seemed fine. They left from the beach that day, seemed fine. Went home, he went to bed, seemed fine. In the middle of the night, though, he woke up with serious chest pains. A little four-year-old boy. Called an ambulance, but it was too late. The child drowned miles away from a body of water. And sometimes that's what it feels like for us. We know that we're saved from our sins because of what our Savior did for us, but it still feels like we're drowning in them. People wanted Jesus to defeat the Romans, but he didn't. They wanted Jesus to get off of that cross, but he didn't. They wanted Jesus to remain in this world so he can continue to heal their sick and feed them as they needed and take away reign as king so that they could have no problems in this world, but he wasn't that kind of Messiah. Instead of giving to them the Messiah that they wanted, he gave to them the Messiah that they actually needed. The real problem 
with the people in this lesson and with us is that we just don't think big enough. We underestimate how all-encompassing the saving work of Christ actually is. We know Jesus died on the cross and that he took away our sins. But it doesn't end there. We know that we're going to be in heaven someday, right? But it doesn't end there. Jesus completely defeated sin. Now, after the sermon, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be saying together the Apostles' Creed, something that we say almost every week here. And in the Apostles' Creed, there's a phrase there that we say very often, um, he descended into hell. Do you understand what that phrase means? Now, Jesus already died on the cross. He already suffered the hell that we deserve. But he descended into hell sometime after he rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. Sometime in that 40-day period, he descended into hell. And the reason why he did that was to show just how thoroughly he defeated Satan and sin and death by opening up the front door to hell and walking right in. That's so thoroughly he defeated sin. And he wanted them to know it, and he wants us to know it. So that when God allows the different problems in our life, the frustrations in our life, he has so thoroughly defeated sin and the consequences of sin that he actually uses it for our good today. This last week, uh, last couple of weeks, I've been in the hospital a lot lately. Not for me, I'm fine physically, but a lot of people in our congregation have been very sick. And uh, one of the, this last week, the, the verse of the Bible that I've been using for them is this. Um, Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It's a great section of Scripture because it, get past, it gets past the part that, yes, our sins are forgiven, or someday we're going to be in heaven, but it gets to our immediate problem right now. And it helps a person to see that the reason why the Lord allowed this problem in your life, apparently. Because he wants to, you to see just how strong your God is. That your strength doesn't come from you, it comes from him. And so he allows these difficulties in our, t- in our life at times. He is so thoroughly in charge of sin and the consequences of sin, the problems in this world, that he actually uses it for good for you and me in ways that we will never completely comprehend. One of the blessings that I have here at this church is I get to preach for funerals. Now, in New York, uh, for the 10 years that I was in New York at that congregation, I didn't have any funerals at all. Um, They were a younger, apparently a healthier congregation, um, but no funerals at all. It was amazing. But coming here, it's been a wonderful blessing to be able to do funerals because there's two wonderful things that people get to see at a funeral. The first thing is when a person dies, when a Christian dies, you get to proclaim in the midst of this awful tragedy, you get to proclaim how God used that for an incredible good that now that person who died is with their Lord. What a blessing to be able to proclaim that. But something else happens at a funeral. That people who don't typically ever go to church, they come to church at a funeral. It is a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel with someone who otherwise would never foot, set foot in a church. And at a funeral, they get to hear the heart and the foundation of the gospel. Think about that, how the Lord uses even the, the worst tragedies in this world to bring about his good. Causing us to be able to even rejoice in our suffering. Even though we don't understand why the Lord allows it, we can rejoice in our suffering. The Apostle Paul says it this way. This comes from Romans chapter 5. He says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. One of the most challenging acts of faith for a Christian is to look at our sufferings and rejoice. 
That, that's difficult. But it's a promise that we have from our God. We can do that because we understand that our God has so thoroughly defeated sin. He has so thoroughly saved us that he, we know that he uses these things for our good, for the good of those around us, for the good of his kingdom in ways that we'll never comprehend. He is exactly the type of Savior that we need. Amen. Please stand. And we'll say together the words of the Apostles' Creed and, and note in there, um, as we just talked about the fact that he descended into hell, how thoroughly he defeated hell for, or sin for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. During the offering, please ask you to sign these yellow cards. You have them in your bulletins or in your pews in front of you. One side for member, one side for guests. And you can place that into the offering basket as it is, um, as it is passed to you. Thank you. If you grab your announcement sheet on the way in, you can see uh, a number of prayers that are on your sheet. Again, 
If you didn't grab one, please grab one on your way out so you can continue to pray for these people. Um, a couple of things, one for just an update for Mr. Bain, uh, Ben Bain, our principal. He has declined the call to uh, Zion Lutheran School in South Milwaukee, so we'll be staying here. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> A number of other things. Uh, Gary Baumgarten, uh, that, that is a typo. Um, he's going to be having surgery this Friday, so it wasn't on the first, but it will be this week, so we'll pray for him. Uh, those hospitalized, Sandy Hunter, Vicki Pulver, Steve Lobeck, I believe I heard Darlene Johnson got out of the hospital. We'll continue to pray for her as well. Butch Schrader and then the Anthony, who's a co- cousin of Stephen Westner, are critically ill. We'll pray for them. Those dealing with cancer, Pastor James Human and... Uh, Bonnie Vaher, who is the mother of Linda Clark, will pray for her uh, spiritual and, and physical health. A couple of other additions not on here, uh, one for the, the Gilbertson family, for Jeff Gilbertson's mother is in the hospital, is not doing well, doesn't have much longer to live, so we'll continue to pray for her and for the family. Uh, we also want to pray for the family of Linda Williams, who is the mother of Rob Williams, who passed away this last week. Uh, the funeral will be at St. John's in Sparta at 11 a.m. This, this Tuesday and visitation at 9 a.m. And we'll also pray for the family of uh, Jerry Groskopf, who is the brother of Raleigh Groskopf, who uh, Jerry passed away this last week as well. So we pray for them. We pray. Lord Jesus, you entered Jerusalem on this day many years ago for us. Regardless of what the people, and even we at times, want in a Savior, you were exactly who we needed to be. Continue to comfort us with your forgiveness through word and sacrament. Use the difficulties that you allow in our lives to be according to your will and for our eternal good. Help us to trust in your will more than our own. As Holy Week begins, we pray for those in this area who do not believe in you. Use the efforts of our church and other Christian churches at this time of year so that more can know of your forgiveness. We pray also for Gary Baumgarten, who is going to be having surgery. We pray for Sandy Hunter, Vicki Pulver, Darlene Johnson, Steve Lobeck, Butch Schrader, Anthony, the cousin of Stephen Westner, Pastor James Human and Bonnie Vaher, as well as the mother of Jeff Gilbertson. Lord God, you are the great physician of body and soul. And you, we, we pray that you would look with mercy on these servants of yours in their time of sickness. If it is your will, spare their lives and restore their strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servants and bless the medical means employed on their behalf. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God. And O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, We thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believers, Linda Williams and Jerry Groskopf, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought them to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort their families and all who mourn their death with your precious promises and cheer them with a sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life eternal. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Amen. Please stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. 
Please be seated as we sing that song with that word, Hosanna, save us now one last time. Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you as we begin Holy Week and contemplate just how thoroughly and all-encompassing the saving work of our Savior really was. A couple of announcements. One is for Holy Week services, and and you have this in your announcement sheet too. Monday, Thursday, it's going to be 6.30 p.m. Good Friday, 1 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Easter sunrise service will be 6 a.m. and then uh, the Easter festival services are a completely different sermon and, and service. That's 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Uh, there will be breakfast on, on Easter as, as normal, 7.15 till 10. They'll serve breakfast. And then there will be an Easter egg hunt too. Um, they, in between services, some of you may have been there, but they stuffed 864 eggs. So we have a lot of eggs. Please bring them. I remember last year we had kids walking away with giant bags full of eggs, so we, we want to share that a little bit more, so please come. That'll be at 9.30. They'll start um, out there. If it's bad weather, it'll be in the gym. Um, also, the guarding of the tomb, I, I didn't realize this. Our community is kind of, they kind of see us. They remember us for one big thing, and that's the guarding of the tomb. I actually had a lady this last year who said she drove by when we were doing the guarding of the tomb thing here. And she thought we were a bunch of Vikings standing out there. And, and she said, it's like, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of someday. And she came. It was great. Um, but <laughs> hopefully we can give them a better explanation than some Vikings. But um, it is the garden of the tomb that we do. And all we need is for you to sign up uh, on the far side of the lobby. There's a sign-up sheet there for two-hour um, 
two-hour sections. If you can just be here, we dress up like soldiers, stand out there, and just remind people of what Easter is all about. So that will start. They'll start guarding the tomb Friday night after the, the service, and then all day Saturday, these guys are um, standing out there. So, so hopefully you can join us for that um, and help us out with that. One other thing, we have a number of Easter invites here. We sent out 4,500 of them to the area. Many of you probably already got some um, of those if you live close enough to our church. Um, but if you know somebody who needs an invite, um, somebody who hasn't been to church, or someone who just needs to hear that comfort of the message, we have a number of um, invites in the lobby. There's a couple of people who are going to be handing those out to people who want to give them. If you have 10 friends you want to give them to, take 10. If you have 100, take 100. Uh, we have that many for you. So... God's blessings as we begin Holy Week, and uh, please take some time to greet those who are around you. God's blessings on your week.